June 21st was National Indigenous Peoples Day. Proclamation of this day was announced in 1996 by then Governor General of Canada, Romeo LeBlanc. It was the result of decades of consultation and statements of support by Indigenous peoples. Throughout the year, but especially in this month, we are invited to recognize the rich history, heritage, resilience, and diversity of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. On this day, our Edmonton Moravian Church begins to reflect on our relationship to Indigenous peoples and our role in working towards healing and reconciliation. Our unified board has discussed the need to post on our website, in our bulletins, and occasionally state our treaty acknowledgement at the beginning of our worship. We discussed three reasons for the treaty acknowledgement. First, to acknowledge the solemn agreement made by two equal and sovereign peoples witnessed by God. Two, to pay respect to the indigenous peoples on whose ancestral lands we live, gather, and worship. And three, to acknowledge and affirm the respective rights of each. Therefore, it is right and just for us to state the treaty acknowledgement and I invite you to read the bolded parts. We, the Edmonton Moravian Church, gratefully acknowledge that we live, gather, and worship in Treaty 6 territory, traditional territory of the Pappas Chase Cree. We acknowledge the diverse indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, the Cree, Dene, Anishinaabe, Soto, Natota Iska, Nakota Sioux, Nitsapi, and the Blackfoot peoples. We also acknowledge this as the Metis homeland and the home to many Inuit. Together with all the peoples who have settled here from around the world, this is our home, our Creator's gracious gift. We have been gathered together as God's people to worship on this land. Come, let us praise the Creator. We have been blessed to settle on this land, the traditional territory of our indigenous siblings. Come, let us give thanks to the Creator who sets us free. In this time of worship and reflection, we begin to discern paths to healing and reconciliation with our indigenous siblings. Come, let us walk with a great spirit. I'll uh, light our candles as a sign of God's presence in our midst. I invite you to please stand as we pray the prayer of the directions. Creator God, we, your people, come before you. We thank you for the sunshine, for the breath and life within us, and for all your creation. I invite you to face the east. Great Spirit of Light, come to us out of the East with the power of the rising sun. 
Let there be light in our words. Let there be light on our paths that we walk. Let us remember always that you give us the gift of a new day. Guide our steps and give us courage to walk the circle of our lives with honesty and dignity. And never let us be burdened with sorrow by not starting over again. Invited to, you're invited to turn south. Great Spirit of creation, send us the warm and soothing winds from the south. Comfort and caress us when we are tired and cold. Help us to walk our paths with joy and love for ourselves, for others, for our four-legged companions, the winged ones, the plants, and all creation upon Mother Earth. As you give to all Earth your warm, moving wind, give it to us so that we may grow close to you in warmth. We did not create the web of life, but we stand in it. Whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves. You're invited to face the West. Great life-giving spirit, we face the West, the direction of sundown. Let us remember every day that the moment we come with our sun uh, will come when our, when our sun will go down. Bring into balance the physical, mental, and spiritual so that we are able to know our place on earth in life and death. Never let us forget that we must face into you. Give us a beautiful color. Give us a great sky for setting, so that when it is our time to meet you, we can come with glory. You're invited to face north. Great spirit of love, Come to us with the power of the north. Make us courageous when the cold wind falls upon us. Give us strength and endurance for everything that is harsh, everything that hurts, everything that makes us squint. Give us wisdom so we may be able to make wise choices in all things that are put in front of us. Let us move through life ready to take what comes from the north. And we pray our prayer of confession. Great creator spirit, God of all peoples in all times and places, your creation sings your praise. Your son teaches us the ways of love, justice, and peace. Your spirit emboldens our hearts and hands to build the world according to your will. We confess our brokenness. We do not hear the cries of those who are suffering because it is inconvenient and costly to respond. We do not acknowledge truths that make us uncomfortable. We reject and belittle those who are different than we are. We are blind to the ways we benefit today from a legacy of hurt against indigenous people. Too often, we love imperfectly, speak harshly, and judge quickly. Reconciling God, you call us to gentleness, to compassion, and to radical acceptance of difference. Through the example of Jesus Christ, we are learning to walk in new ways with new companions. By your Holy Spirit, we are learning to surrender the need to justify, to explain, and to fix. By your creation, we are learning to listen. When creation groans, we groan as well. In your people, Hear those who speak out against injustice. We honor their courage and stand with them. Spirit of God, create in us feeling hearts, clear eyes, and open minds. Amen. Brought together by the Creator and reconciled in Jesus Christ, let us offer one another a sign of Christ's peace. 
We offer a sign of peace to one another and our friends on Zoom. Peace be with you. Please remain standing as we join in our hymn number 625. I love to tell the story. 625. be seated. Let us pray. Creator God, the living word, your Son, teaches us how to share the good news of your salvation. Send your great spirit to open our hearts to your truth and wisdom. Send your great spirit so that we may more humbly live and share your word. In the name of the one who sets us free. Amen. In today's Gospel from Matthew, Jesus instructs his disciples on how we are to share the good news. Let us be attentive to the Spirit speaking to our hearts. Good morning. I'm going to be reading scripture today from Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 to chapter 10, verses 23. Workers for the harvest. 
Then Jesus went throughout all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were bewildered and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Sending out the 12 apostles. Jesus called the 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits so they could cast them out and heal every kind of disease and sickness. Now these are the names of the 12 apostles. First Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew and the tax collector. Sorry, Matthew the tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon the, Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Jesus sent out these twelve, instructing them as follows. Do not go to Gentile regions. Do not enter any Samaritan town. Go instead to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. Freely you received freely give. Do not take gold, silver, or copper in your belts. No bag for the journey or, or no extra tunic, sandals, or staff, for the workers deserves his provisions. Whenever you enter a town or village, find out who is worthy there and stay with them until you leave. As you enter the house, give it greetings, and if the house is worthy, let your peace come on it but if it is not worthy let your peace return to you and if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your message shake the dust off your feet as you leave that house or town i tell you the truth it will be more bearable for the region of sodom and gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town i am sending you out like sheep surrounded by wolves so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of people, because they will hand you over to councils and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be brought before governments and kings because of me, as a witness to them and the Gentiles. Whenever they hand you over for trial, do not worry about how to speak or what to say, for what you should say will be given to you at that time. For it is not you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will hand over brother to death and a father his child. Children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by everyone because of my name. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Whenever they persecute you in one place, flee to another. I tell you the truth, you are not finished going through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. We have heard what Jesus did in his ministry and how he went about doing it. The Gospel says that Jesus healed. He cast out evil spirits. He raised the dead. Jesus also taught and preached. The gospel is clear about what motivated him and what was in his heart as he did his ministry. Verse 36 reads, When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus had compassion for them. Now, I've spoken a lot over the past several months about compassion. Perhaps you could see this as a hallmark of my preaching. And it's hard not to emphasize this considering Jesus in the Gospels. You recall Nicodemus, the Samaritan woman, Jesus being compassionate to doubting Thomas, Lazarus. 
We see Jesus responding in so many different ways, compassionately. Throughout the century, this gospel has shaped how missionaries evangelized Europe from the Middle East. And later, this gospel shaped how European missionaries evangelized the world. This gospel continues to shape how we share the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not a historian of Christian evangelization. I'm not an expert in how Christians did evangelization over the past 2,000 years around the globe. But I have studied Christian history in general. And what I can say is that evangelization, or rather the making of Christians, has been complicated by other motives, such as coercion, politics, imperialism, and colonialism. In many times and places, people didn't become Christian intentionally or even consensually, but unintentionally and even through force, not out of empathy or compassion, but through other negative forces. Perhaps you know how your distant, distant ancestors became Christian. Perhaps you know if it was done consensually or otherwise. Over the past decades, we Canadians have been learning about how our indigenous siblings became Christians, particularly through the residential school system. This began in the late 1990s when a royal commission drew attention to the lasting harm that was done by the residential schools. It continued with Prime Minister Harper's official apology in 2008, which sparked the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, or TRC, the TRC spent six years traveling to all parts of Canada and listening to more than 6,500 witnesses. It hosted seven national events across Canada, including here in Edmonton, to engage the Canadian public, educate people about the history and legacy of residential school system, and share and honor the experiences of former students and their families. The TRC culminated in a multi-volume final report that contained 94 calls to action or recommendations to further reconcile between Canadians and Indigenous peoples, and we are still living out many of these calls to action. We learned that for a period of more than 150 years, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis Nation children were taken from their families and communities to attend schools which were often located far from their homes. More than 150,000 children attended Indian residential schools, and many never returned. The first church-run Indian residential school was opened in 1831. By the 1880s, the federal government had adopted an official policy of funding residential schools across Canada. The explicit intent was to separate these children from their families and cultures. In 1920, the Indian Act made attendance at Indian residential schools compulsory for treaty status children between the ages of 7 and 15. The TRC concluded that residential schools were, quote, a systematic government-sponsored attempt to destroy Aboriginal cultures and languages and to assimilate Aboriginal peoples so that they no longer existed as distinct peoples. The TRC characterized this intent as cultural genocide. The schools were often underfunded and overcrowded. The quality of education was substandard. Children were harshly punished for speaking their own languages. Staff were not held accountable for how they treated the children. We know that thousands of students suffered physical and sexual abuse at residential schools. All suffered loneliness and a longing to be home with their families. The schools hurt the children. The schools also hurt their families and their communities. 
Children were deprived of healthy examples of love and respect. The distinct cultures, traditions, languages, and knowledge systems of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples were eroded by forced assimilation. The damages inflicted by residential schools today continue. Now, some of you may have participated in the blanket exercise. Has anyone ever participated in that? It's good to see. So the blanket exercise was created by many Christian organizations and churches, and it helps uh, people, not just Christians, to learn about the history of indigenous people in Canada, to learn it quite intimately. I've had the blessing of participating in three uh, blanket exercises in schools and in parishes, and in many of them, many eye-opening experiences were had. Uh, many shared their own personal testimony of the hurts and harms, as well as the questions and frustrations. In light of today's gospel, I wonder, where was Christ-like compassion in all of this? Now, thankfully, the major Christian traditions that ran residential schools in Canada have apologized for their role. All agree that while there may have been some good that came out of it, altogether, the residential school system was deeply damaging and wrong. While there may have been compassion demonstrated by some, altogether, the residential school system was deeply damaging and wrong. In fact, it is inappropriate for non-Indigenous Canadians to say that any good came from the residential school system. When the underlying motivation of the system was forced assimilation, even acts of compassion are tainted by a sinful structure. Mainstream Canadian society has accepted this, and officially all mainline Christian traditions have also accepted this, Catholic, Anglican, United Church, Evangelical, Lutheran, and Presbyterian. In light of today's gospel, we recognize that the sin was rooted in a lack of compassion, a lack of compassion for the religions, traditions, way of life, languages, autonomy, and lives of indigenous people. In our drive to expand and settle a country, we force people off the land and force them into our way of life. Rather than humbly accepting their way of life and their traditional territories, we suppressed and destroyed them and occupied their land and made treaties that benefited our nation's goals. I love how we chose the hymn on 625, I love to tell the story, yes, we Christians are commanded to tell the story, but we are not called to force our story on others. We are not called to suppress other people's stories. We are called to share our stories humbly and compassionately. Now, I suspect bringing light to these truths is unsettling for us, to say the least. And so I invite, it, invite you now into a period of guided meditation. I invite you to take your palms and to place them on your laps, turning them upwards so as to receive grace. Look at your hands. Notice every line and wrinkle. If your hands could tell a story, what would they speak? A lifetime of joys and challenges. A lifetime of story. Give thanks for your beautiful hands. We have heard how our Christian ancestors have used their hands for good, for ill, with good intentions, with intended and unintended negative consequences. I invite you now to close your hand, making a fist. 
This fist reminds us of our hardened hearts, our lack of compassion, our lack of humility, our greed and selfishness. We are reminded of our Christian ancestors who acted with such hardened hearts. In today's gospel, we hear how Jesus heals, casts out demons, and raises people from the dead. Open your hand again. Open them so as to receive this healing and grace from Jesus. Hearing the sins of our ancestors can raise frustrations, confusions, and anger. What comes to mind? What comes to heart knowing that our Christian ancestors forced our indigenous siblings to surrender their children? What comes to mind, what comes to heart knowing that our Christian ancestors suppressed culture, traditions, and languages? What comes to mind and to heart knowing that our Christian ancestors abused their power, abused indigenous children mentally, physically, and sexually? Imagine placing all that in your palms. Imagine the weight of those thoughts and feelings. Maybe adding some pressure to your hands on your lap, on your legs. The good news of Jesus is that we are not left in our sins, but we are saved from them. I invite you to Gently lift up your palms so as to offer God our sins. You can raise them as high or as low as you wish. Offer up our sins with humility, with compassion. Feel the weight of those grave sins being lifted. Feel the relief of God's grace taking away our sins. In silence, give thanks to God for that. I invite you to fold your hands in prayer, interlocking your fingers. Imagine yourself united with our indigenous siblings today. The work of healing, casting out demons, raising the dead, isn't just Jesus' work, but he commissions us to do the same. See in your hands a commitment to work with each other for healing, casting out evil, and bringing new life to others. See in your interlocking hands a commitment to unite your work with Christ's work in us. For one minute of silence, I invite you to listen to God stirring in your heart and your mind. He may return your hands to a resting position. Listen to the Holy Spirit. You may even speak to God about what's in your mind and on your heart. Let us pray. Creator God, Great Spirit, we humbly come to know, to, to know you, to know that our Christian ancestors have done wrong. Give us hearts of compassion so we may walk the long road of reconciliation with our indigenous siblings. Empower us with wisdom and courage to understand one another, to heal one another, to reconcile one another, and to raise others to new life. We make this prayer in the name of Christ, who sets us free. Amen. Before we continue with our hymn, I invite us to a period of solidarity prayer. I invite uh, Doug to turn on this beautiful Cree prayer, um, a song crying out to God for healing and help.
That chant from a group called Young Spirit uh, that was formed many years ago from a small indigenous reservation here in Alberta. Last year, uh, traveled to the Grammys in Los Angeles because they, want, they were uh, recognized for their music. This song that we just heard is a Cree prayer. And uh, in my rough translation, it reads and prays, Father, Creator, Help us now. Take care of us today and always. Provide for us food to eat. Bless all men, all boys, all women, all girls, and all on the land. We give praise to you, Creator, Great Spirit. Let us unite our praise as we join in him. Number 627 called by Christ to love each other, 627.
seated as we pray our prayers of the people. God's amazing grace is offered to us today, tomorrow, and forever. For what and for whom shall we pray? You're invited to share your prayer aloud. Doug there has the mic. If you wish to share, you can raise your hand. Let us turn to God in prayer. Loving Father, we give you thanks for our lives. We pray for wisdom, good health, healing, and grateful hearts, for all your blessings. In silence, we lift to you our personal needs. God of love, hear our prayer. Creator God, we pray for the earth, our mother, who sustains us. We pray for the wisdom and courage to protect it, the plants, the waters, the air, the trees, and all animals. In silence, we lift up the cries of the earth. God, our creator, hear our prayer. O oh, great spirit, we pray for your people, for our indigenous siblings, for members of our families and our church, especially Wilma and her family, for gratitude, for rest, for Wilma. We pray for Xenia traveling back to Ukraine, for her family and for the whole nation of Ukraine. We pray for Dale and the memory of his mother. We pray for Nicole, who struggles with drug addiction and mental health, for treatment, and for her mother. We pray for the Synod in Pennsylvania, for the work of the Spirit in your church, for our representatives who are traveling home. We pray in thanksgiving for Audrey's uh, home selling and a good transition to a new home. And we pray for Stephen and uh, Sefka, who are presenting at Synod and safe travels back. We pray for others in silence. We pray for those with whom we work and learn and play, for the frightened and the lonely, for those who grieve, for those who are desperate and angry, for those in prison, for the hungry, the homeless, the poor, for those we perceive as our enemies. God of compassion, hear our prayer. God of all nations, we pray for your human creation, for the end of war, ethnic conflict, and all violence, especially in Sudan and Ukraine. For liberation from racism, bigotry, and injustice. For freedom from all addictions. For the end of abuse of children, women, and men. For each member of the human family, that all may know the dignity and worth of being a child of God for solutions to our common human dilemmas, and for our dedication to be part of those solutions. God of justice, God of love, hear our prayer. Gathering our prayers into one, we pray this indigenous translation of the Lord's Prayer. O great spirit, our Father from above, your name is sacred and holy. Bring your good path to us, where the beauty of your ways in the spirit world above is reflected in the earth below. Provide for us day by day the elk, the buffalo, and the salmon, the corn, the squash, and the wild rice, all the good things we need for each day. Release us from the things we have done wrong in the same way, we release others from the things done wrong to us and guide us away from the things that tempt us to stray from your good path. For this land, your creatures, your splendor are yours now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. 
Creator God, Great Spirit, on this day that we celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day, we bring our journey together with you and with our Indigenous siblings. We commit to continually learning from your Great Spirit speaking to us in them. We commit to your Great Spirit purifying our hearts and minds. Reconciled by Christ, we are called to reconcile each other and all creation. Come to us, Great Spirit, so we may walk in your good path. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join now in our hymn number 635. We are called to be God's people. 635. remain standing for our benediction. May God the Creator bless and keep you. May Christ the Creator who sets us free teach you and grant you peace. And may the Great Spirit lead you from here a reconciled and reconciling people. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>